My name is Stefan Herman, and uh, I come to you today to speak about youth, because that is a passion that I have developed over the last years. So just as of recent, scientists are alerting us that by the year 2050, 70% of people employed, they will do jobs that are not even invented yet. It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe. 70% of the jobs that people will do. So what does that mean for our youth? How do we prepare them for this kind of unknown territory? One thing is for sure, it's not what we have been training them to do. Something has to change. Because the holy grail of education, knowledge, and information is so readily available in the palms of our hands these days. It takes me literally about two minutes to find out anything. A child today takes one minute, me takes two. So, today I come to you with a bold proposal. My proposal is that you, the person in your chair, can play a role in preparing the next generations for what's coming. And I call that the new way of mentoring. So, you, the person in your chair, I'm proposing you become a mentor. Stay in your seats. <laughs> it scared me when I heard this the first time. I'm going to propose to you that there's a new way of mentoring, there's a new way of building community where we can actually support the children that are coming up, our next generations. And while we do that, we benefit personally from that. I have personally benefited tremendously. So let me ask you this question. When was the last time that you saw a group of teenagers and a group of adults do something meaningful together? Oh, and there was no ball involved. <laughs> now, we kind of laugh about that, but there's something really, really deeply wrong about that. If you haven't been in a group of adults doing something with teenagers, there's something wrong, and this is one of the results. Last Monday, the Times of India dedicated the front page story to the news that in 2017, which is literally last year, just a few months ago, about 10,000, just less of 10,000 students, young people, took their own life. There's something majorly wrong with that. That means that every day a child takes their life. Every day of every week, every week of every month, every month of every year. That's not okay with me. It's not okay with me. Something needs to change. There's an empty chair somewhere in a classroom right now. There's an empty bed in a family's house. I want you to put a face with it right now, because this is just numbers. It's not okay. It's not okay that children take their lives out of despair, out of a system that we created for them where they see no other way than ending their lives. And there's something we can do about that. That's why I'm here today. That's why I'm talking to you. So here is a vision that I'd like to present. A vision that has something to do with the solution. The solution is in mentoring. I've done it for the last decade, over a decade. I've seen kids really blossom when adults give them the attention, and they do it in a particular way. That's why I'm saying, please stay in, stay in your seats. You'll be able to do this if you want to. Here's a vision where we can use India's strength, the very matrix of what makes India so special, and for the last 12 years has me come back to India, at least once a year, 
I love this country. There is something really special about this country that I don't find anywhere. I travel a lot. I was a pro tennis player way back. There is something special about India. India has the potential to lead the world, literally lead the world, because there is something in the very fabric of this country that is emotionally strong. If I look at your, at your music, if I look at your dance, if I look at your spiritual practices, your rituals, if I look at the traditions in India, if I look at your architecture, I see it everywhere. There's potential for emotional intelligence, maturity, that India can really lead the way. And I've dedicated the, the next four years to being here in India to make that possible. I relocated, literally live in Pune now, and it's an honor to be here and to give back to the country that I've taken from in so many ways on a spiritual level. So it's really my honor to be here, and hopefully you'll join me to become a mentor soon with us in Pune or anywhere else in the world for that matter. Let me tell you a little bit about my own history. So, when I was just coming into puberty, and I was a handsome young boy, as you might see, my brother molested me. My brother sexually abused me. He was stronger, he was older. And the result of that was about 25, almost 30 years of deep inner confusion and shame. I was very, very impacted by that. I couldn't make sense of what happened. I just knew there was something wrong about it. It just didn't feel right for the longest time. And then I had built a lot of shame that kept me from being honest about it and talking with somebody about it. And that's where this mentoring comes in, because we mentor in groups. And the confidentiality and the safety that is built in the group where adults sit with eighth graders and with sixth graders. If I had had such a group, if I had had an opportunity to, say, to take my pain, my confusion, my shame to a place where people were, were ready and willing to hold that for me and with me, something could have changed for me and I wouldn't have gone through about 25 to 30 years of suffering. Violence and bullying, you know, I just talked about suicide. Almost 10,000 kids last year killed themselves at their own hand. And there's a lot of other dysfunctionalities going on that kids are getting into these days because when we don't take care of our kids, when we don't really get them into a connection with the adults, with us, they're, we're competing. They're, they, are, they are competed for by others. One is, for example, gang violence. Gangs are out to get our, get our kids, and they go into all kinds of criminal behaviors. When you look at all of the statistics I'm showing you here, you're going to see that about 20% minimum of youth in India right now are in some form of trouble. I don't want to spend too much time on, on every detail here, but you see even at the level of stress, 90.6% of students in India report stress over academic pressures that they have. That's not okay. We've got to change that. It's not, there's, there's nothing wrong with the kids. There's something wrong with the system that we created. It's for us to change that. It's for us to be there in the transition because it takes time to change these things. Us as adults need to step up for our youth, substance abuse, alcohol. If you l read the list, anorexia, cyber violence, obesity, rape, there's all these issues. And generally speaking, there's about one out of five children in India is involved in some kind of dysfunctional behavior. It's not their fault. They are just looking for a sense of belonging, for a sense of dealing, for a sense of avoiding isolation, and that's where they typically go. Depression is rampant amongst young people in India. We can change that. And we can change it by applying a way of mentoring that is different than what you might hear when you first think of mentoring. You think like, oh, it must be that like kind of a thing where I have to show some life experience. I have to be, I have to have had some success in my life. I have to be somebody. I have to be able to give something to the children. That's not true. 
There's a whole new way of mentoring. There's a revolution of mentoring going on right now that I'm supporting, that I'm willing to bring here to India, which, which has more of an approach of being eye to eye with each, with each other. Whereas not, there's not a superiority and a, and, a, and a lower level, but we're actually really relating to each other. Everything that we do has a notion of exploration, inquiry. It's really mentee focused. It's not to make myself look good that I mentor somebody. I mentor somebody to really be in service and to build a community where kids are taken care of. Mutual learning, very, very important, based on curiosity. How wonderful is it to be curious? We heard some of the examples of the former speakers here. They apply a lot of creativity and curiosity to the world. That works for kids. There we go. So what we do in this revolution, there's do-do's and don't-do's. The do-do's are we listen, we accept them for who they are, we model behaviors, and when we actually screw up from time to time, anybody ever screw up uh, in this room? Is there anybody who has a, once in a while a slip or something, you know? Yeah, when we screw up, it's not about being perfect as adults. It is to learn to model how to clean up after oneself when I screw up. Because screwing up is human, yeah? And then to bless them, which sounds a little bit religious. We're lacking a word there. I don't mean it in any way religious. Um, it has something to do with giving an affirmation, with actually expressing what I actually think in my head about somebody else. To bless somebody, tell them that I like them, tell them that I, aspects of their character that I appreciate, those kind of things, to speak it out loud rather than keeping it in. Those are the things that we do do. Can you do those things? You don't even need a lot of training to do that. To listen closely, you don't need to know, you don't need to know anything. You just need to focus on listening. And that's what the kids need, because they want to speak. That's where we have a great match. They come as teenagers going through this incredibly tumultuous time. All of these body changes, expectations, stress, all this stuff going on. All they want to do is unload. They want to talk. They want to express themselves. They want to talk about what's going on for them. And all we have to do is just be there and hold space for them. Can we do that? I think we can. I see it all the time with the mentors that we trained in Pune now. I'll give you a few examples in a moment. So what we don't do is we don't come from an approach that says they need fixing. As soon as we think there's something wrong with them, even though sometimes they screw up. We already clarified that we screw up too from time to time, right? So there's nothing wrong about you screwing up, but there's also nothing wrong about them screwing up. Teenagers need to push the envelope. They need to kind of find out where they stand and who they are. That's the time for them to find their identity, right? So it's important for them to have a, a space where they're being accepted, where they, nobody relates to them as they need to be fixed. Something's broken about them. There's nothing broken about teenagers. We don't rescue them. We let them do their work. We let them deal with their own challenges. We're not telling them it's okay, it's going to be okay, you know, pat on the back, you know, the stuff that auntie typically says, you know, yeah, the advice giving. We're not doing that. We're not giving advice. We're not rescuing them from them actually solving their own problem. We're just holding space for them. And we don't project our own stories on them. Whenever they share something about what's going on in their life, our response is not instantly to tell our own story. And trust me, I'm seeing myself do that all the time. Because there's still a lot of things that I don't feel anybody's listened to me for. So I need to tell that. I'm dying to tell my story. And so the, the child has no more space, right? Because now I'm, I'm basically flushing every other space with my own stuff. Yeah? So we need to learn to unload. We need to learn to complete our own stories. We heard that before today and then have space for the children in our lives. So this all leads to emotional intelligence. It leads to a level of maturity that I think will, all of, will help all of us. All of us going into community, really connecting with each other, and having a way of being authentic and honest. The circles that we conduct in the schools with eighth graders who are trained as peer mentors and sixth graders are called truth-telling circles. That's a place where the kids are able to tell their truth. And we had an example in one of our um, pilot studies that we did. Because see, every, I've taken this program from the US where I lived for the last 17 years in California, Santa Barbara. I took it to Europe, 
German-speaking Europe, UK, South Africa. Now I'm bringing it to India, and every time I go anywhere, it needs a slight adjustment because the culture is different, people are different, right? So here we're applying a slightly different, different approach, and so we're training these eighth graders and sixth graders to, to learn to open up, and we have a few adults in the room who are holding space, basically. Yeah? And um, so I want to tell you a story about uh, when I first started this work in Santa Barbara. So um, this mother comes up to me and she says, um, I would really love to en enroll my boy into this program that you have. He only has two options in his life. He's either going to die in the next two years or he's going to go to jail. And even when he goes to jail in the next two years in an American prison, he's going to die as a Latino boy. No chance. Not good options. Today, this boy, and I'm still in touch with him many years later, he's a nurse. And here's one of the things that happened. He came to one of our circles, truth-telling circles. He checked in saying, today, I walked across the schoolyard and I had the knife already open in my pocket. You know, one of those that you fold, right? He said the knife was already open because that boy disrespected me. He needed to learn a lesson. I was about to teach him a lesson. As I walk over, I realized as I walked that my rage, my anger had the best of me and that I needed to somehow balance that out. And so by the time I reached him, we actually started talking and now we've become friends. Uh, uh, not only one life saved, two lives saved. Because he would have gone to jail for that, right? And in Santa Barbara, at that time, turned out he was a gang leader of the West Side Gang. At that time, we had about five to eight fatal deaths due to gang violence in Santa Barbara, in California, out of about 100,000 people in town. So this was a huge win for all of us. So my pledge to you is that please join us. Please be available for the children in the world. This is the way that we can change it, not knowing what the next steps might be and how to prepare them. But one thing is for sure, if we can build community where we all get together, we build neighborhoods that are really connected, we have a way of dealing with the future in a different way than we're doing right now, seeing all of these deaths and all of these dysfunctionalities. Namaste. Thank you very much.